Well, good morning. It's glorious to be with you. If you would, please take and turn to Colossians chapter 1. Seven years ago, my wife and Emily, I'm going to move this down a little bit. across the country. We lived over in the, a different part of Mesa, and my wife had wanted to go to a church that was over there within walking distance, but I, uh, I wasn't quite sure about that church, so I got online, and I was looking for churches that had similar doctrinal beliefs to the church that, that we'd come from, that we had held, and we found Cornerstone online. And so we decided to come here, and we, we came in, and we were greeted very friendly by, by the greeters that morning and, and found a place to seat. Uh, I, I, we were new, so I'm pretty sure it was probably toward the back, probably close to where we're sitting now. And, and some people came up and introduced themselves to us and said, you know, we'd love to talk to you after the service. And so we, we went through the service, and, and Pastor Jim was preaching that day, and the, the preaching was good. Uh, Pastor John Forbes, who's no longer with us, he, he was leading the worship, and the music was good, and, and it, it seemed nice. And, and then after the service, we were uh, immediately welcomed by a number of different members in the church, and just asking us why we were here, where we come from, all of these sorts of things. And, and they invited us then to come to Many Flocks, and, and back then, Many Flocks was being held in homes. And, uh, and I, the reality is I, I couldn't make it. I was doing graduate studies, and because of the move, I had fallen behind. And I needed to get some work done on that Sunday afternoon. But my, wife, my wife's a little strange in, 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 in some good ways in that she is very okay going to new places with new people without me. She's, she's oftentimes more inclined to go do things and with people that she doesn't know than I am. And so, so she went to the house of one of the members here and, and you know, participated in the, in the Bible study and in the fellowship. And then the time for prayer came, and, and she was just open about some of the things that my family was dealing with, the fact that I had quit my job and had moved here unemployed. Uh, I was hoping that Chick-fil-A would take me on until a school. I hoped to find a job in a school. And immediately, members came to her. Even the next day a member called me and offered me financial assistance. I wasn't a member here. I didn't even know if we were going to stay here. But this member, this, this member of this church immediately reached out and said, if you need anything, let us know. And that is ultimately what kept Emily and I here for these past seven years. You, you can go to a lot of churches and hear good preaching. You can go to a lot of churches and hear good singing. But it's the faith and the love of Cornerstone which, is kept, is which kept, brought us here and kept us here. So now, five years ago in 2016, I'm working in my grad studies, and one of the expectations of that class is that I, that I choose a prayer of Paul and that I interpret it and write a paper on it. And immediately I fell in love with this passage, and I knew that I wanted to preach this sermon here, not knowing if, when or if God would, would provide it. And so this morning, he has, he has provided that opportunity. So um, some of the things are different. Obviously, I, I don't have the authority nor the eloquence of Paul, um, but I do pray, for the, pray this prayer with Paul for Cornerstone. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time to come to your word. And Father, we pray that you would bless this time. Father, I pray for Cornerstone, and, and I do echo the words here that we'll look at of Paul, that they would Enjoy these things that Paul prays for, and Lord, that they would understand the glorious redemption provided by Christ. So God, bless us this morning in the richness of your word and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So he begins in verse 9, and he says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Pray for you. The reality is that this is likely a church that Paul has never met. He hears of their faith and love from Epaphras, a fellow servant in the gospel. And so even though he had never met them, they were constantly on his prayers. He says that we pray for you without ceasing. We have not ceased to pray for you. 
I, I don't think that this means that prayer was like everything he did all day long. He wasn't constantly on his knees in his closet praying before God. But the idea that MacArthur phrases it is that he had this God consciousness so that he was constantly thinking, what is God doing in the world? What is God calling me to do? And he was praying for individuals as well. And what is it that he was praying for them? He says, asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This word to, to be filled is in the passive tense. He is not asking or praying that the church would fill itself, but that God himself would, would fill them. And we see that he would be filled them with the knowledge of his will. Oftentimes when we hear this phrase, knowledge of his will, we often think of what is God's plan for my life? Is God calling me to go to this school? Is he calling me to this career? Is he calling me to marry this individual? But here, this is not the will that Paul is praying that they would be filled with, that they'd be dominated by, that they would be so overwhelmed with that it would control their lives. Rather, he is talking about the will that is revealed in God's word. In Proverbs 29, uh, or sorry, Psalm uh, 143.10, the psalmist prays, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Here, he wants them to know the word of God and what it is that God has called them to do. D.A. Carson puts it this way. He says, what God has mandated is his will. Our responsibility is to do it. And so here we see that, that Paul is praying that they would have a fuller, deeper understanding of who God is and what his will is for them. That they would understand all that Christ has accomplished for them and that they would be ready to obey it. We know from other parts of the letter that the Colossian church was, was struggling with some things such as pluralism and syncretism. Pluralism has this idea that there is this whole array of other religious beliefs surrounding them. And syncretism has the idea that, that many were in danger of taking and absorbing different religious thoughts and sort of bringing them into Christianity. This was a great danger to them. We see in chapter 2, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head and of all rule and authority. And I think what we see in our day, that's, that's a constant threat. We see that there is this, always this threat that we would look out at the world and start to adopt the world's philosophies into our congregation, into our thinking and so Paul is praying here that they would have a biblical revival, that they would center themselves first and foremost on what God had revealed in his word. We see this in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Oftentimes this verse is misunderstood to think that, that the pastors need to pr produce some sort of vision. This is what God wants us to do. We need to do this. We need to do this. But in reality, what, what, the, what the writer of this proverb is saying is that the word of God is the prophetic vision. And where the word of God is absent, people cast off the restraints. They go to all sorts of wickedness. This is what the Colossian church was in danger of. This is what we are in danger of. Because we're surrounded by this pluralistic society that wants to equate all things as equal. And he wants them to be filled with this knowledge of God in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. This idea of walking doesn't have only to do with deed, but it has the idea of every, every thought we have, every word we speak, every deed we do, both our action and our inaction, all of those things coming together should be done in such a way that they are worthy of the Lord. And again, this idea of, of worthiness is often missed to us because of our Westernism. We, we are a part of a society and we have grown up in a culture of this rugged individualism. 
I can do it myself. I don't need anyone else's approval. I will do and be what I want to be. That's what we are taught even from our, our youngest days, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. But that wasn't the culture of the ancient Near East. Their culture was one of community. And in their culture, when one person did something wrong, it not only brought shame on that individual, but it would bring shame upon their whole clan. And so here, Paul is wanting them to understand that, that the way they live is not only representing themselves, it's not even only representing their family, but they are representing Christ. And he calls us then to live in this way that we would be pleasing to him. But here we, we have to be careful because there is this pendulum and we have to hold this tension together. The, the one side would say that I am free to live and do what I want. It's my own decision and I'll be who I want to be and sin has no real significance, at least not on others. On the other side, there's this constant dread of shame that it leads to inaction and there's no room for mercy. There's no room for grace. There's no room for compassion. And both sides would be terribly wrong. And the beauty here is, is that we, even though fallen creatures as we are, we can, we can please God. We see this first in Thessalonians, um, Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul writes, finally, then brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you recede from us how you ought to walk to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. And so in writing to the Thessalonian church, Paul is saying, you are pleasing God. And he's just encouraging them to do more and more. But then we also have that beautiful verse from Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Even though we are fallen beings, even though there is still sin in our lives, we are still called to walk in a worthy manner and we can please God. And what is it that it looks like to, to please God? He says, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now this bearing fruit, this, this already has been hit on in verses 5 and 6, if you look up above it, verse 5, about halfway down, Paul writes, Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you and is indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. This bearing fruit is evidence that God is working in the world, and it is produced by the gospel. So often we think of the gospel as simply the means by which we are saved, and then we need to move on to more things, better concept, more principles. But listen to what Paul also writes in Ephesians chapter 2. The, these first verses probably memorized by all of us. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. And we gladly use that verse in our evangelistic efforts with our lost friends and our lost neighbors that it's no work that you do. Nothing you can do can save you. Nothing you can do. Come to Christ. And that's the right plea. But we can't leave off verse, verse 10. For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so the purpose of the gospel is, yes, to save us, but it's also to sanctify us. And good works should be flowing out of us as a church and as individuals. And what, what we see here next is that there is this bearing fruit in every good work and an increasing in the knowledge of of God. There's this beautiful thing that takes place here that when we are fulfilling God's word and we are doing the good deeds he's called us to, we grow in this deeper knowledge of God. Paul does not want us to be satisfied with the status quo. And I think for a church like Cornerstone, that's a very dangerous thing. 
We are a church with good elders and pastors who love and preach the word well. We are served by deacons who carry out the labors of ministry in the church. Just this morning, my, my daughter was remembering fonder times when in that room right there was Sunday school and how she was taught God's word. We are filled with families who love God, discipling their children, growing. It would be very easy for Cornerstone to simply be satisfied with who we are. And yet, Paul says, don't be that way. Paul wants there to be this growing of good works and this growing of knowledge. And it's almost cyclical, right? In that as we fulfill what God's called us to, we come to a greater knowledge and love of God. And as we have a greater love and knowledge of God, it propels us even more to more good works. And it's not like a circle, but it's almost like a spiral stairs that we get more and more good works and more and more knowledge of God. This is what God is praying for them. But he also recognizes that there's constant danger surrounding them. There's all this danger that the world presents to them, both on the outside and with the, by the sin from within. So in verse 11, he says, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. That word all again has the die of every single bit of God's power, the power that's present in the universe, may that be used to strengthen you. May you have all of it. And if you're confused on what it might look like, it's the, it's the might of God that he's praying for. And why do we need this? For all endurance and patience with joy. Endurance here has the idea of, of steadfastness, of, of stamina. We think of a long-distance runner needing to keep going. And the reality is, is that we as Christians are not individuals self-sufficient to sustain this long race. We are dependent on God's power and grace. But we don't do so just with endurance. We need to do it with patience. Patience here has this idea of long-suffering. It has the idea of doing it without complaining, of not being uh, simply those who do the right thing. Rather, we are to be joyful. We are to trust in the all-wise and all-gracious providence of God. I think sometimes, and, and, and there are times when this is right, right? In, in a marriage relationship, at least in a normal one, I think mine's normal, there is sometimes conflict in that relationship, and there are times when you have to do the right thing when you don't want to do the right thing. And even though your heart is saying, don't do it, you know you have to do the right thing and you do it. I think sometimes we have that idea about everything. I can constantly be complaining. I can constantly be upset and annoyed. But as long as I'm doing the right thing, that's all that matters. That's not what Paul is teaching here. Paul is teaching that our emotional state does matter. It's not simply enough to do the right thing. It's not simply enough to endure, but we have to do so with joyfulness. We see this in our great example, the Lord Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, now Hebrews chapter 12 comes after Hebrews chapter 11, and we often refer to that, that text as the hall of faith. Right? Those who have gone before us, those who have persevered, those who have done amazing things, some in great power, others to, to their own death. Right, And so he comes to this verse and he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before us, since we are surrounded by them, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith. We look to Jesus as our example because he has already gone through this trial. He has already gone through all that we will endure and he is now in the heavenly places. He's the anchor that holds us. We look to him who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so what do we see in Jesus? Jesus all along knowing that the cross was his end point. Knowing that the shame and the mockery that would come during that passion leading up and during his death. He knew all of that. Was Jesus a man just constantly complaining and, and griping about all of the ills of the world? 
No, that's not the Jesus we see. We wouldn't be in love with Jesus if that's who he was. But Jesus was a man full of joy, and he did because so because of the joy that was ahead of him. So we need to be strengthened. Now, the next verse, is a, it's a little bit different to quite understand what we're doing here. And it says, giving thanks to the Father. And so some interpreters think that now Paul is the one giving thanks. But rather, I think this is connecting to verse 11. May you be strengthened. And now that may you be is also connected to here. May you be giving thanks. He's praying that we would be a thankful people. He's praying that we would recognize what God has done and that we would be thankful. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. The the idea here of being qualified means that God has made us fit. We were previously unfit. And now we are fit. We are able to access what it is that God has prepared for us. And what is that? To share in the inheritance of the saints of life, uh, saints of light. God has prepared us and equipped us through the accomplishments of Christ so that we can now enjoy the inheritance that those who have gone on before us, the saints, who are in the light or of the light, And light probably making reference here to God and to Christ, who is the light. We have been made qualified. We have been made fit to be able to enjoy this great inheritance that lies ahead of us. In verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. He has set us free from the kingdom of the devil, the kingdom that is opposed to God, and has instead transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. And so we are no longer those who are enslaved to the evil one, but we now are citizens and inheritance of the kingdom of the beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In Christ, in this beloved son, there is redemption. And what is redemption? We think oftentimes of redeeming something as buying it back, but what does that mean? Jonathan Edwards puts it this way, by Christ purchasing redemption, Two things are intended, his satisfaction and his merit. The one pays our debt and so satisfies. The other procures our title and so merits. The satisfaction of Christ is to free us from misery. The merit of Christ is to purchase happiness for us. And so in the cross, two things happened. One, we had this immeasurable, unpayable debt to God because of our sin. The only expectation we could have in this life is death and hell. That's the only thing we had to look forward to because there was no means by which we could satisfy the just payment of our guilt and sin before a holy and righteous God. And so in the cross, Christ suffered all of that wrath. He is our propitiation. He satisfies the wrath that was meant for us. And so that's good. He brings us back to this neutral ground. We're no longer morally retrobate. But we need righteousness to stand before God. And so in the cross and in the resurrection, through faith, we are united to Christ so that all is his becomes ours. And all of his merit allows us to to gain the title that we need, that we can be sons and daughters of Christ. And so in one way, His death completely wipes away all of the condemnation we deserve. And in another way, it pays for us to have entrance in to the promise that God had given to us. And this is what God has done. And you might be thinking we're going to get out of here early because I've just now finished the last verse. And I think if we stopped right now, we would have had a good message. Maybe not the, the rhetoric or the presentation of the, of the content would be that good, but this was a good word. But what I want us to understand now, and this is why I fell in love with this passage five years ago, is Paul is doing something way more than what I just did. And, and I'm going to try to unfold some of that for us, and I'll be honest with you, I'm just scratching the surface. When I, when I was praying over this passage and studying this passage on Tuesday, it felt like this incredibly deep well And I was just barely skimming great water off the top, but there's just so much more here. And so I want us to to try to open our eyes a little bit more to what all Paul is trying to unveil in this passage. The language he uses is important, and this is why I think we're so desperate 
not as a, a church necessarily in particular, but a church globally, why we're so desperate for biblical revival, for the word of God really becoming central to our lives so that we love it and feast on it. And I'll admit to you that if it wasn't for great commentaries, I wouldn't necessarily have been aware of all of these great things. So I'm not speaking as one who's arrived, but one who is with you in desperate need of more Bible in my life. Paul here is unveiling the glory of the redemption. And that's not to say that what I've already said isn't glorious enough, but Paul is going to really help us understand how great this redemption is that Christ has accomplished for us. Now he begins with this language of be filled with the knowledge of his will. Why would Paul say be filled? Why wouldn't he just say, and I pray that you would know everything that God's commanded? Why does he use this language? Well, this being filled language should beckon our minds back to the Exodus. And I think the Exodus of Israel is going to be a, a central part to what Paul's doing here. But, but there's a whole lot of great redemption history here. But this beckons us back to Exodus chapter 31, verse 3. And I have filled him. So he's, he's now preparing the people of God to worship God. And what they needed in that old covenant period was some sort of tent, a, a tabernacle where the spirit of God would dwell in a particular way, in a, a fully manifested way that's unique to that time. And so he needs this hand. He says, and I have filled him with the spirit of God, with ability, with an, an intelligent, with knowledge and craftsmen. And we see that same language used in Exodus 35. And so here, the reason I think Paul is using this language of be filled is he's becking our minds back to the Exodus, but not just to the Exodus, to the passage that we've already looked at in Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11, as, as Charles already pointed out, is, is becking us and reminding us this is a prophecy about Christ and in verses 1 and 2, it says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from, the, from his root shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon the Messiah. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding shall be with the Messiah. The Spirit of counsel and might shall be with the Messiah. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And so everything that Paul just prayed for this Colossian church and for us through the Spirit, this is something that has been given to the Messiah. Then he says a little bit further down that he wants us to be bearing fruit. Again, why would he use this bearing fruit language? Why would he not just say, and I just hope you abound in good works? That's what he said in Thessalonians. Why does he now use this bearing fruit? Again, I think he's beckoning us now back to creation itself. Genesis 1, verses 11 and 12. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plant yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which there is in their seed, each according to its kind. And then what did God say when he saw this? God looked down and he saw the bearing of fruit by trees. And what did he say? And God saw that it was good. And so Paul here is now beckoning us even to creation. And we know from that creation narrative how quickly it went wrong. Here was this beautiful creation that God had created with a man and a woman, and it was very good. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3, it completely collapses when sin enters into the world through the sin of Adam. And so what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying where Adam and his progeny, all of those who came after him, where they failed, Christ will not fail. And not only has Christ not failed... But those who are his people will also not fail. When God's creation was supposed to bear fruit, it failed to do so. It fell into turmoil. It fell into sin and disrepair. And yet, God has fixed it through his Christ and through the people of his son. And again, then we have this idea of, of, of bringing in this fruit. And so, where... How do we see this as evidence of this? And so in Isaiah 11, we see this filling of the spirit of the Messiah. And what the reality is, is that the church is evident, is evidence that Isaiah 11 was about Jesus. Now we can go and we can say, we believe that Isaiah 11 about Jesus because we believe this is God's word, but it's evidence because 
The Messiah was filled with these things, and now his church is doing the same. We are proof that Isaiah 11 was fulfilled and is still being fulfilled. And we need, then, this power to continue in this according to his glorious might. And we see this, this glorious might. Where do Old Testament uh, people go when they think about the glorious might of God? Well, they go to the Exodus story, right? And we saw those ten mighty plagues in Egypt where God completely destroyed families and society to show that he was God and that those other gods were false gods. He did all of these things, even to the extent that now Israel is leaving. They're making their exodus out of Egypt. Some two million, they say, were going with them. The people of Egypt were were throwing their jewels and their wealth at them on their way out. Others were even saying, we deny these gods and we're going with you. And then Pharaoh does what? He says, I've lost my mind. I've let all of my workforce go. I need to get them back. And so he goes to pursue them. God then creates this wall of fire to protect them until in some great demonstration of power, the people of Israel walk across on dry land. And they see all of this, right? And what happens immediately after they see all of this? They get a little thirsty and they start complaining and grumbling Oh, Moses, oh, God, have you just brought us out into this desert to kill us? Have you just brought us out here that we should die? And we look at them, we think, how in the world are you like that? You saw all of this power. And I think sometimes we wish that we could see that sort of power. I've listened to some of the, the old-time sort of pastors who would talk about the Shekinah glory, right? And this, this long wish that we could see that sort of manifestation of God's power in that way. And yet, if we want to see real power, where do we see real power? Real power is evident, evident in God's people persevering with patience. If you want to see the real power of God, Look around and see Christians who are enduring hardship, who are enduring sin, who are enduring trial, and they're doing so with patience. Because none of that would happen. All of us would flee if it were not for the mighty power of God. And we can do so because we know the end of the story. So I, I, I'm a Miami Dolphins fan. That, that usually is not a good thing. Uh, at least for a really long time, and they play all the way on the East Coast, right? Which means their games usually start around 10 o'clock, right? Right as church is about to start. And so I very rarely get to see my, my team play live, but, but sometimes I can go and watch the replay of it later. And uh, I, I, I'm what you call a Fairweather fan, and so I, I get on and I sort of see who won, who won the game, okay? And if they lost, I, I might watch the 10-minute you know, replay cap. But if they won, I might watch the whole thing, right? And so I get on and I'm watching the game and maybe they come out and they're just not playing well. They're making a lot of mistakes. And normally, and this isn't something to emulate, but but sometimes I'll yell at the TV, oh, why did you do that? Right? But in this game, in this game, I'm not doing that. Why? Because I already know who won, right? And then we maybe in the second quarter, man, they're starting to play really well right? And there's a great play, and they get a touchdown, and I'm, I'm cheering, because we always cheer for the good things, right? And then the third quarter, they kind of play okay. They've got the lead maybe in the fourth quarter, and then three minutes left, a terrible play's called, and now my team's losing. Normally, I would be jumping around, hitting my hand in my fist, saying, why did you call that play? Why did you do that? What were you thinking? Come on! But not today, Right? Why not today? Because I already know how it's going to end. I already know the end of the score. And that's the kind of confidence that we can have. I can watch that game and enjoy it with complete unknowingness of how it's going to unfold, except I know who's going to win. And that's how we are living in this life. This is what God has done for us. This is why we need to know his word. Because we're living in this life, not necessarily knowing how every single event is going to happen. So there's some excitement there, right? We don't always know what's going to happen, what's going to unfold. But we always know how it's going to end. We know that we are on the winning side. And what is it that we will receive? We will receive an inheritance of the saints of light. 
an inheritance. That's the language the Old Testament constantly used for the promised land, the land of Palestine, the, the land where, where Abraham and his, his sons dwelt until they went off into Egypt. And they always knew they would come back to that land and that would be their land. And we know that that land was simply to foreshadow a greater land that is to come the new heavens and the new earth. We, if we are united to Christ, that is our inheritance. And we know that no matter what happens in this life, long as we are persevering, long as we are doing so with patience, we know that that promised land is ours. And so that we have been delivered from the domain of darkness. Ten times in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, the word that's used here for deliverance is used of exodus. We ourselves are in this great exodus. We ourselves have been united to Christ, and we are now in the wilderness waiting and driving to the promised land, and we will be delivered from that domain of darkness. Just like the Israelites were delivered from that terrible slavery and bondage to Egypt, we too have been delivered from slavery and bondage to sin and Satan in the world, and we are now making our progress to the promised land. And what is it? It's the kingdom of his beloved son. This is the language that's used in 2 Samuel 7. Yes, some of those things are fulfilled when, when God's making his covenant with David, that there would come one after him, that he would raise up to be king. And yes, in some ways, those things were pointing to his son Solomon. But it says that his, his, his kingdom and his throne would be established forever and ever. And I'm pretty sure that no one is sitting on Solomon's throne, but Christ throne that's at the right hand of the father it is forever this is what we are being driven towards this is what we are going to we are going to the kingdom of his beloved son and why because of redemption and forgiveness of sins and this here this is this is clearly new covenant language in Isaiah 31, starting in verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. And so here, Jeremiah is beckoning back to that first exodus as well. He's, he's beckoning back to that first covenant as well. And, and what was interesting about that covenant is that they didn't keep the covenant. God had done all of those things in great demonstration of power, in great demonstration of covenant faithfulness, and they didn't keep the covenant. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. Is that, what, is that not what Paul is praying here? That the, that the law of Christ that the word of God, that the will of God would be so filled in us that it would be in our hearts and it would be written on our hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Isn't this what Paul was praying? That they would know God? So that they don't have to go around to each other in that Colossian church saying, hey, you need to get saved. You need to know God. No, they all know God. It's a unique covenant. It's something radically different from the first. And then, he, and then Jeremiah ends this section with this way. For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sins no more. This is radically different and better than the first exodus. In that first exodus, what did they have to do? Sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. And what were they constantly reminded of? They were constantly reminded of their guilt and shame before God and their need of someone to save them. And yes, we come to the Lord's table and we celebrate what Christ has accomplished, but we're not doing it as this perpetual sacrifice. It only reminds us that our sin has been dealt with on the cross. This is what Paul is saying in all of this. He's saying, Look back to the old covenant. Look back to Israel. Everything that Israel endured, everything they went through, simply prefigures the eschatological Israel, the Israel of the end times. The Israel is to come. And who is that Israel? It is us. It is the church. We are what God's mission was driving to. And Paul wants this Colossian church, and I hope that in some way I've been able to communicate some of the depth of what he did, but Paul wants them to understand what has happened at their conversion because it's absolutely amazing. 
It's glorious. God's glorious redemption is amazing. And notice then what he does. The next section, verses 15 through 20, most scholars believe is an early church hymn. So Paul, in in telling these Colossian believers how he's been praying for them and all that God's doing for them, what does he immediately do right after that? He burst into praise. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that is in everything. He might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And so Here we see that Paul is so amazed by this glorious thing that God has accomplished for his church. He stands and praises God. And so may we now do the same. May we stand and worship the Lord together.